Tonight, we take a look back over the illustrious career of one of the longest performing leading men of all time. Join us as we take a rare, in-depth look at what has made Peter Carey a true stage legend. Let's look beyond the mask and explore the incredible career both on and off the stage of this larger-than-life performer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the incomparable Mr. Peter Carey. Across between 
the fantasy of the bedroom and the same You were just a backstreet girl Hustling and fighting, scratching and biting Heart flying in the door Did you believe in your wildest That you'd become the lady of them all Well, the stars in your eyes When you crawled in at night From the bars, from the sidewalk From the gutter theatrical Don't look down Someone I come from the world The view is not exactly clear A shame you did it all But what to say There are no mysteries now Nothing can thrill you No one to tell you Heart behind the door I hope you Come to terms with boredom So famous, so easily So soon was not the wisest thing to be You won't care if they love you It's been done before Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special evening where we'll be taking a look back at the career of a West End and Broadway legend, Mr. Peter Carey. Two iconic songs there from the beginning of Peter's career, Superstar from Jesus Christ Superstar and High Flying Adored from Evita, both with music by Andrew Lloyd Webber and lyrics by Sir Tim Rice. Roles in these musicals would mark the beginning of Peter's career with these musical impresarios which would span over five decades. Tonight, we will be taking an in-depth look at the man who has been voted the world's greatest phantom, not once, but twice. We will be delving back into the archives of iconic images. We will be looking at some props and also some original costumes. Now, please welcome back to the stage from the musical Chess, singing anthem, Mr. Peter Carey. And you 
Peter, it's Rhea Jones here. Hello, long time no see. I hope you're keeping well during these crazy, crazy times. I hope you're having a wonderful evening. I have some great memories of us singing duets together in concert. One was singing You and I with uh, you at the Bryn Terrell vinyl concert. Such great fun. And trying to keep a straight face with those twinkly eyes staring back at me on stage was quite hard. I always remember whenever I've worked with you or seen you always say, oh, I've got a bit of a bad throat tonight. I'm not, it's not feeling so good. And then you go on stage and sing like an angel. You crack me up. You really do. You're so naughty and I love you. But I want you to have a, a lovely evening celebrating with family and friends. And I wish I could be there in person. But hopefully we'll get to sing a duet together one day in the not too distant future. Sending you lots of love. Take care. Bye. Another fantastic song there by Peter. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Bowden Rooms. My pleasure. Peter, where did it all begin for you? Well, it started way back in time when I was about uh, two, three years of age sitting in a high chair. So my mother says, but mothers do say these things. And uh, I used to, before I could speak, I used to sing with, uh, you know, kind of hum along la di da -da's baby talk uh, to the music. And then when I got into school, uh, they started, uh, they found out that I could also sing and they started asking me to sing 
in the assembly and then doing a kind of the Urth Eisteddfod. The Urth Eisteddfod is a big, huge thing in Wales. And uh, so I sang there about three or four times uh, up until six, seven, eight years of age. Um, the Beatles came along and totally changed me. <laughs> I then started singing uh, kind of all the Beatles songs. And then uh, a group came along and said they were forming, would I like to be the lead singer in it? So I did, and they called it Peter and the Wolves. I didn't have anything to do with the name, but Peter and the Wolves came out. And, and then we started, uh, we did quite well. These were all guys that were going to university, and they were brilliant musicians. Uh, there were five of us. And uh, we started opening for big bands, uh, like uh, the Stones in the Capitol. And we did uh, theater. Uh, we did uh, in Cardiff. We did, uh, oh, the Pacemakers, Jerry and the Pacemakers. We, we didn't open for the Beatles. I'd have loved to have done that. But uh, we did all that type of thing. And then they all went off to become uh, kind of very clever people in university. And I decided I'd go solo. And that's how it all started. So then from your solo career, how did you find your way into musical theatre? Oh, disaster. <laughs> disaster. I ended up, I thought that, I, you always do, you think you're going to be a huge sensation. So I came up to London and uh, I ended up sleeping rough in London and uh, getting very ill. Um, and I got a record deal, uh, but the illness beat me to it. And then I had to go back home for a year and a half, two years uh, to get over that. And when I was there, I got asked then to sing, uh, to do some local recordings uh, for a local studio called Dreig Recording Studio. And uh, what happens is somebody would come in with a song that they've written and they want somebody to sing it and I'd get pulled in to, to sing it, which was great because I was on the road to recovery after kind of being pretty ill. And, uh, and then I got asked to join a group uh, uh, there was playing in uh, the Corbett Country Club, and it was the Dave Gibson Trio, and I was the compare, resident compare and singer. And then all of a sudden, it became a permanent thing. I was a professional singer. And from there, it just grew. I ended up uh, asking, being asked to sing in all different types of, uh, of places in, in South Wales. And then I got asked to do summer season in 1976. Anybody remember 1976? It was a, a heat wave, uh, tremendously hot. And I just happened to agree to do a, a summer season down in Cornwall. So I ended up very brown. <laughs> and uh, I had a great time. And uh, then an agent came along and asked me would I like to sing um, with Bernard Manning, not with him, although he got a great voice. Uh, but he had the embassy clubs, and so I ended up going up to Manchester and uh, singing in his clubs. Then I went down to London, and then I was in rough land because I was sleeping rough and busking on street corners and wherever I could earn a couple of bob. So from busking yeah. to Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar, <laughs> how did that transition work out? Well, I had, a, I had an old guitar which was very useful because I, I always fancied myself for writing uh, music. And uh, I couldn't play it properly. I could play it, but just basically. And uh, I, I'd use the, the fretboard for rhythm. So I'd be doing the rhythm on, on the, the fret and I'd be singing any old song that came into my mind. And this guy came along and I thought he'd put a five pound note in, in my little kind of bag, uh, but he hadn't. He put a card which said, please give me a call I think I can help you. And so I called him and he was an agent. And the next thing I knew I was uh, doing an audition in Her Majesty's Theatre in London for a new musical called Fire Angel. And uh, they all got excited and, and I got excited because, hey, they wanted me and it was great. And so I was uh, second cover to the third lead. There's always two covers to a, a, a principal. And the first cover, I hadn't learned the role because it was so fresh. Uh, me, I had nothing to, else to do but sit in my little, I now had a, I now had a, a bed set, which was about the size of eight foot by four foot. And it wasn't very big. And so I had nothing to do but learn the script. So I, I learned the, the script for it, the, his role, the principal's role. 
And uh, so I went on. Uh, I didn't know any of the moves. I had no experience and all that. And they were pushing me around the stage to be in the right place at the right time. And there was a guy in, in the audience, this is weird, there was a guy called Stephen Bentink, uh, who was a, a, a professional kind of uh, producer. And uh, he was producing a, a musical all about James Dean. And he found the dead image of James Dean visually. But the guy couldn't sing, uh, and he was a bricklayer, a hod carrier, uh, for, for, you know, for real. So he came to see the show Fire Angel, and he liked on that particular night, because only I, did, I only did one show as, as the, the third lead, and he happened to see it, and he asked me would I go for an audition with him, and I did, and so he offered me this role of uh, covering James Dean, because James Dean couldn't sing, and he invented this role, which was uh, stage manager for all of the films that James Dean filmed. He only did four. And uh, so I opened the show and I used to walk across the stage, climb a set of stairs and they put me halfway up the proscenium arch, halfway up there on a little platform. And whenever James Dean, who was down on the stage, whenever he had to sing a song, I, for some unknown reason, got up and sang it and uh, so that worked out pretty well for me because some of the songs were really nice. And um, a guy called Bob Swash, who's a big um, theater producer, uh, they had um, Jesus Christ Superstar going and uh, they were just about to start doing Evita. Uh, he came and saw this uh, production and he liked me up on the platform halfway up the proscenium arch. And so he said, would I go and audition for Evita as uh, Magaldi? And so I said, yeah, wow, of course I will. So I went along, uh, but before going there, they sent me the tape of the show and I listened to uh, Che Guevara's role and I thought, geez, I can do that. And the guy that was rec had recorded it was also Colin Wilkinson, who I'd just been working with. So I thought, well, I can do it as well as he can. And so when I went there, I said, listen, uh, and I sang uh, Night of a Thousand Stars, which was good fun. I said, but I really think I could do a better job of um, Che Guevara. And so they said, all right, well, well, we'll audition you for that. So there I went, I went back and I auditioned for that. And uh, they said, okay, but the guy that produced it all, the guy that wrote it rather, which was Andrew Lloyd Webber, and Tim Rice. Tim Rice wanted Elaine Page to play the role of Evita, and Che Guevara was to be played by a famous person. So I wasn't famous, so they turned around and uh, gave it to David Essex. And then I, the, Bob Swartz turned around and said, well, listen, don't worry about it, because what we'll do, we'll put you into Jesus Christ Superstar, because you can do Judas. And so I went in there, and I was there for three years, and then they asked me to go in and play Che Guevara, so. So Peter, we're lucky enough to actually have some of your original used costumes here. We have the yeah, Judas see. costume from Jesus Christ, your original Phantom costume, and also Che Guevara from Evita. Now, apparently there's an interesting story as to how you acquired these costumes, specifically, <laughs> specifically the Judas costume. Well, the Judas costume uh, was made for me, purposely made for me, and uh, it, it fitted me very well at the time. And then, this is in 1980, uh, a long time ago, uh, and then they put up the, the notice that we were closing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just fancied keeping a memento, because uh, the show was coming off, and I thought, well, it's going to hang up in... A, uh, some kind of place out of sight. And I thought, well, it could hang up out of sight in my house. So I chucked it out the window uh, on my last day there. And my brother was downstairs. This is two stories up. So my brother caught it, dumped it into a car, uh, and, and was gone. And when I got home later that night, there it was, uh, hanging up, waiting for me to make it safe. So yeah, that was... That was that one there. Uh, you've got to admit, that, that's a really nice costume. 
Absolutely fantastic. And I've kept it ever since 1980. Wonderful. I know. Now, from all those musicals to then one of your biggest roles of that time would have been Jean Valjean in Les Miserables. Les Miserables. Yeah. So how did that come around? Well, as I said, I, I had a string of, of theatrical kind of productions. Uh, I started off with Fire Angel. We went into, into uh, James Dean. We went into um, Avita. And then I went into chess. And from chess, uh, I got invited back to do uh, a, a, a Vita, but on tour. So I ended, I ended up playing uh, Che Guevara. Um, so all, all in all, I, I played a whole string, one after the other. And uh, the last one I was doing was playing Che Guevara on tour uh, with uh, Rebecca Storm, who was playing uh, the part of uh, Evita. And they came to see Rebecca for Les Miserables, uh, to play the part of Fontaine. So I ended up then uh, being asked uh, uh, when playing in Le Miserable as uh, Jean Valjean to go over and quickly rescue uh, the part of Phantom because they were one and short. So I went along and did that. We're going to hear you sing a couple of songs from Les Miserables now. Is there any standout yeah. moments for you from that musical? Oh, God, many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, well, there was, you know, there's a... When you play lead roles uh, in the West End, uh, there's a lot of pressure on you. And uh, the pressure is not necessarily front of house. The pressure is backstage a lot. And um, they brought a guy over from, from Australia who ended up becoming a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, so he was playing uh, Javert which is an uh, equally big role, uh, but he felt it should have, the show should have been based on Javert, and that's how he'd been playing it over in Australia. And uh, Cameron sent him over to join me, and I'd been playing uh, Valjean for, for quite a while, and I'd got into the groove of the way I played it, uh, of playing Jean Valjean. And so, I got, asked, I got told that there was a new guy coming in to play the part of, of Javert, and uh, so I was called in for rehearsals. And uh, the in-house director was sitting halfway back in the stalls, and I said, what are you, what are you doing there? You know, we're not rehearsing. He said, yes, we are. I said, well, where's the guy I'm rehearsing with? He's playing Javert. And he said, he's sitting on top of the barricade looking at you. So I looked up, and there was Phil Quast sitting on top there, cross-legged, uh, meditating. And uh, so I waited for him to come down. And when he came down, he said, we'll be playing this the way I played out in uh, Australia. I said, oh, are we? And I looked at Ken, who was still halfway down in the stalls. And uh, Ken said, sort it out, boys. I'm not worried how you played. It's going to be great, whatever. And so, so we then started this battle royal uh, over the two lead roles. And it was a battle all the way through. And, but we ended up the best of mates. And it was electric. His Javert with my Valjean was really incredible because he was brilliant. He was, a, and he had a great voice. Peter, we're going to hear some songs now from Les Miserables. Yeah. Do you have any interesting stories that you'd like to tell us? Well, there was, there's always uh, things that happen on stage because it's, you, know, you can't stop and start. It's whatever uh, starts off continues and you either uh, sink or swim with it. And uh, there, was, there was a couple of lovely stories regarding Le Miserable, especially. Um, you know, I was in that for a long time. And uh, on one occasion, um, this is in the, uh, in the barricade scene. Uh, Valjean has um, just come over the barrier and he's down on the, on the, the ground floor and Angelas has turned around and said, um, Javert is tied to a chair. So he gives me Javert and says, Javert is yours. So I went down and I cut 
the thongs uh, that were holding Javert. And we do this tater tate thing, and it, it, what I'm saying to her is, uh, if you need me after this is all over, you'll find me at uh, 15 Rue Plume. Uh, now go. And he runs off into the wings, and I lift my rifle, my wooden rifle. I lift it up and I pull the trigger and the guy at the sound desk at the back of the hall presses the button and bang! The gun goes bang and it's great. And then I walk into the scene and all the company on the barricade start banging the rifles on the, the wooden barricade, show their approval of me having shot Javert, which everybody thinks I've shot Javert. On this occasion, everything went pretty well. Uh, I went, got him to the, the wings and Javert's run off and I lift my wooden rifle and I pull the wooden trigger and the sound guy presses the button and bang, the bullet goes off. And then I turn and walk back into the scene and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this big fat pigeon, dead as a donor, lands at my feet. Now, I, there's no pigeon in, written into the script. So I'm looking at this pigeon, and the audience are all looking at the pigeon. And I thought, what the hell do I do now? So I thought, well, I, I better ignore it. So I, I stepped over it and walked uh, to my where I'm supposed to, which is on the far corner, and I stand looking wistfully over the heads of the audience. And every head in the place is looking at me and they're all saying, what's with the pigeon? Where'd the pigeon come from? What happened there? And I shrugged my shoulders and I just said out loud, I said, don't ask me. I don't know about the pigeon. <laughs> and that was the, this whole kerfuffle at that time. And of course, all the company were falling about laughing as with the orchestra. And what it was, you might be wondering, where did the pigeon come from, was there was a, a fly guy living up on the roof, literally living on the roof. He'd been there for years, donkeys, donkeys years. And it was his last show. He was retiring, he was leaving. And he wanted everybody to remember him. So, we now remember him, Eddie because he found a dead pigeon in the water but up on the roof and thought, I know what I'm going to do with that and when I'm going to do it. So he waited for me to, to pull the trigger and then just lobbed the bird over the top, which was very funny to a lot of people. Fantastic. I know. A magical moment. Reprising his infamous role as Jean Valjean in the world's longest-running musical Les Miserables, with music by Claude-Michel Schomburg and lyrics by Alan Bubel and Hermit Kretzmer, singing Who Am I and Bring Him Home. Please welcome back onto the stage the infamous Mr. Peter Carey. Touch my soul. 
him rest Heaven blessed Bring him home Bring him home Bring him home He's like the son I might have known God had granted me a son The summer die one by one How soon they play on the dawn And I am old and will be gone Bring him peace Hello, Peter. It's John Owen Jones here. Uh, remember me? Um, the chap that um, followed in the, the trail that you blazed. <laughs> Peter Carey, uh, leading light, um, certainly one of the great Welsh performers of all time. Um, he's someone that I've looked up to for a long time and certainly someone that opened many doors for people like myself coming from small towns in Wales to work in the West End and beyond. Uh, you showed us how it was done and uh, we followed you, so thanks for that. Uh, I remember once, um, we worked together a couple of times, of course, um, sang together, and uh, I must say, for the record, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I haven't heard you sing for a while, but um, you've still got it, mate. You can still smash those tunes out there. I remember once um, a little story that um, encapsulates Peter Carey's personality and uh, work ethic, and um, how, well, just how purely talented he is. Uh, I was working with him. We were in the Glynn Hall in Neath at some event. I can't remember quite what it was, but um, uh, we were both singing at the end, you know, and uh, I turned up at like four o'clock for sound check, as everyone else did, and but Peter, for some reason, couldn't. Um, and I did a sound check, went through the music with my um, sound guy that was, you know, pressing all the buttons and making me sound good. I was a bit nervous about it, of course, because I was singing with Peter Carey. And um, the show started at about 7.30, and at 7.29, Peter Carey strolled in, late for some reason, and uh, he just... And we were all very stressed, of course, and he just handed his CD to the sound guy and said, oh, just play that and I'll sing along to it. No sound check, no rehearsal, no prep. And we were all like, oh, what? this is a disaster waiting to happen. But of course, at the end of the night... Um, Peter's track started playing. He walked on stage to rapturous applause, absolutely nailed the song with no practice whatsoever. Um, and I guess that just goes to show how talented and, um, well, incredible and, and unique he is. So um, 
I've tried that myself, never been quite as successful as Peter Carey, just turning up and singing. So, um, yeah, that, that pretty much encapsulates him. Anyway, uh, best of luck, Peter, um, as you go forward. Keep safe, and hopefully I'll see you um, on stage again one day soon. All the best, mate. Hi, Peter. Ronya Renahan here. Long time no see. I hope you're really, really well. The first time we met was when we were cast in the original company of chess at the Prince Edward Theatre in the late 80s. Um, such a fun time. And that was the first time that I got to hear your incredible voice and what an impression it made on me. I was really lucky then to work with you again um, as Fontaine opposite your brilliant Jean Valjean at the Palace Theatre. Such happy memories of those times, Peter. Um, and you were really, really lovely to work with. I hope you have a wonderful evening, and I'm really, really glad that everybody's getting to hear that wonderful voice of yours. Lots of love, Peter. Hello, Steve Balsamo here. I'm a singer and a songwriter and sometime a uh, musical theatre person. Um, I've been asked to say a few words about Peter Carey. So the first time I saw Peter was playing Jean Valjean in Les Mis a, well, a, while, a while ago and was absolutely blown away. I thought he was incredible. And not long after, I got in the show myself. And um, the first thing that the director, Ken Caswell, asked me is if I knew Peter. He said, do you know Peter Carey? I said, no, I just saw him playing Jean Valjean a while ago. I said, why? I said, oh, the, and he said, the last time I saw him, he tried to strangle me to death and throw me across <laughs> his dressing room. And I was like, whoop, he sounds like a man after my own heart. Um, I've been lucky enough to sing at some concerts with Peter over the years and was always blown away by his incredible voice and presence. And uh, it's just relaxed attitude, shall we say, towards life. <laughs> it's been my inspiration. I think Peter's been my spirit animal. Uh, the last time I saw Peter and sang with him was at a concert for Dear Chris Needs at the Grand Theatre in Swansea a couple of years back. And even though Peter had a cold, he still sang like he was about 25. And i got to be honest, it pissed me off. Um, so love you, Peter. Hi, Peter. Rebecca Storm here. I hope you're having a fantastic night tonight, celebrating your marvellous career. I had the pleasure of spending, what was it, almost two and a half years together? 1987, 1988 in Evita and Les Mis. Fantastic memories of your amazing voice and lots and lots of laughs. So I'd just like to send you loads and loads of love. Congratulations on a, a terrific career. Enjoy your evening and I hope we see you soon. Loads of love. Bye. Dear Peter, I'm so happy we are able to speak about you and uh, able to say how much I love you and I admire you. And what I've learned from our first collaboration in Les Miserables, 1988-89 in Les Miserables. And of course, the second time we played together in 1996 with Francis Raphael and Lisa Hall and uh, this amazing cast that, uh, you know, we played together. And I love the way you taught us and how you sang. We were all sort of mesmerized by your singing and your beautiful talent. And I also love the fact that we were together in Les Miserables. Uh, on July 14th, 1989, and Bastille Day, singing, you know, the uh, the national anthem uh, of uh, of uh, France. And um, I just want to tell you that you uh, are my greatest inspiration, and you're someone I loved very much from the first uh, few performances. I felt this closeness with you. And as you said, you know, Protos Philos, my best friend, uh, this is how I feel about you. And uh, Peter, forever you will be uh, in my heart and one of the best inspirations I've had in my life. Thank you so much for everything we've done together. I'm here to reminisce about Les Miserables, which was the most successful and still is the most successful show on the planet. And a lot of that is down to you. 
uh, playing the lead role, of course, a massive singer. And anybody that's ever seen Les Miserables, well before they, they cut the orchestra, he said bitterly, and moved to another theatre, the first act used to be an hour and three quarters long. And for your character, Jean Valjean, that was a huge taking and you nailed every line every night well every note you got some of the lines wrong sometimes but i'm not here to be bitter anyway after going through the first act of an hour and three quarters then came the second act and it was a time when your character had to carry marius through the sewers and who came along to play marius only myself now i've still think that I should be in the Guinness World Record for the widest, the tallest and the heaviest and probably the loudest Marius that's ever been. And uh, I need to apologise to the fact that if you've ever got a funny walk, it is down to me and I'd like to apologise to your chiropractor because you were to pick me up off the floor, throw me over your back and sing so all i can say is man weir drugeni i am so so sorry for that slight arch in your back um i'd like to send you lots of love i hope you're safe i hope you're happy if you've enjoyed my message this is stephen parry and if you haven't it's michael ball well hello mike sterling here peter carry what can i say you're unique, my friend, and uh, if I cast my mind back to 1988, um, that was uh, 33 years ago. That was the first time I saw he was Valjean. Um, it was the greatest thing uh, I'd ever seen at that point, and uh, <laughs> still is. There's no one to touch you for the role, mate. You were the first uh, I saw, and uh, the last that had an impression on me. Ah, quite a good... Uh, good time playing it myself and uh, you taught me a lot and you inspired me a lot and uh, I'm glad to say that since that time over the last 33 years we've kept in touch and become really good friends and uh, I treasure that immensely. Often referred to as the greatest phantom of all time, one critic once called him the definitive phantom. Singing a medley of songs now with music by Andrew Lloyd Webber and lyrics by Charles Hart. Please welcome onto the stage the incomparable Mr. Peter Carey. Point 
of no return. The final threshold, the branches cross so stand and watch it burn. We pass the point of no return. Each sensation Darkness stirs And wakes imagination Silently the senses Abandon their Let your mind start a journey to a stop. 
strange new world Leave all thoughts of the world you knew before Let your soul take you where you want to be Only then can you Sweet intoxication, touch me, trust me, savor each sensation, let the dream begin, let your darker side give in to the power of the music that I write. Power of the music of the night. Hi, Peter. It's John Barrowman here, and uh, I'm in my dressing room right now at uh, Dancing on Ice. There's the TV over there with all the stuff and the contestants behind us. That's why I'm wrapped up. It's a little chilly. Um, I tried to think of the many things that I could talk about uh, that we did backstage, and uh, as I thought about it, I thought, I can't really talk about them because they're not for public consumption. Um, we did have a wonderful time. Uh, all the times that I, uh, you know, uh, flashed you, mooned you, came into your dressing room and rubbed up against you while you were getting ready. Uh, the chats before you would, uh, when you would get your makeup on or when you'd wake up between your nap between shows and I would pounce into your room and make a lot of noise. Um, I'm sure it really like, you know, it, you, were, you were gracious in the way you took it on board, but um, uh, I know sometimes it probably was a little bit loud, but I will say the one thing that I do remember and uh, that will always stick with me is as my career was starting to be able to watch you on stage and see how you uh, took on the role, handled the singing, uh, you know, uh, performed the role of Phantom. Um, and I learned quite a bit uh, from what you did uh, by watching you because I, uh, over the years I've, I've learned by watching and that's one of the most important things that I think I can pass on to other people. Uh, just to be able to hear you sing that role. I've worked with other phantoms after you uh, left the show, and I will say this, that your vocal performance, your uh, emotional performance is up there with the best of them. And uh, that's how I remember my time in phantom with you, Peter, is that you were one of the best phantoms that I'd worked with. So. I thank you for that and I hope you're doing well. I hope everything's great. I um, hope you're being safe during this COVID time. And one day I'll tell all the, the stories to everybody and I'll put it in a book, but it'll be published when we're all, uh, we're all in that uh, big theater in the sky. That'll be, <laughs> yeah, right. It ain't never gonna get published. Anyway, all my love, Peter. God bless, lots of love and uh, uh, stay strong. Bye, my love. Hi there, Peter. 
been a long time since you and I shared the stage at the Pantages Theater, the bright lights and the big city. Playing Christine to your phantom was and always will be a huge highlight of my career. Thank you so much for all your advice, for the open dressing room, for the laughs, for your kindness. You are always a first-rate gentleman, 100%. You taught us so many things, Peter, but most importantly, you taught me that theater comes from the heart and it's new and different every night. And I remember this night, especially the 10th anniversary. That was a very special memory for us. And Canadian theater applauds you. I applaud you. I don't know what I would have done without you. Cheers to you, mate. I'm so lucky that I have a chance to work with you, Peter. Uh, your talents and your work ethic really inspire so many of us. Now I'm teaching all these little kids and I always talk about our phantom stories. Um, you were amazing every single night. You were like up there and, you know, sing your hearts out and Every night was perfect. And even when those times that's not 100% perfect, remember you lost your lyrics that day? You know, but you handled it like a pro. And I remember this so well. So I tell, teach my kids and myself that we are professionals. We are on stage every night and we still messed up our lyrics. What do we do? It's just like Peter have to carry the story and do not even blink. So this technique is gold. So right now, all my kids are amazing. They go go to like concerts and they will they will forget the lyrics. They go blah blah blah, and then they pick up again. So thanks to you, Peter. Do you know this story? No, now you know. Hey, Peter, Deborah Dutcher here. Thank you so much for the invitation to walk down memory lane with you tonight. I wish I could be there in person to help celebrate your fabulous career. You and I met, believe it or not. 20 years ago on the UK tour of Phantom of the Opera. You were my Phantom and I was your Christine. I remember it like it was yesterday because it was the first time that I was living and performing in the UK. One of the things that I remember the most is sharing the stage with you. Your rendition of Music of the Night was amazing. And I got to listen to it every night. One of the things that I will never forget is da 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 and you'd hold it for days and the audience loved it loved it every time so thank you for that memory peter and i hope tonight brings you a lot of really wonderful memories too lots of love so the phantom of the opera peter has obviously been a huge part of your life uh, yeah a huge role, uh, physically demanding, mentally demanding. How did you prepare for that role? Um, well, it, it, it all started uh, in the rehearsal room. Um, when they first took me into the rehearsal room, I was playing Jean Valjean over in Les Miserables, and um, an unexpected turn of events took place where they suddenly had to shoot, shove me over to Phantom. And we didn't have very long at all. Um, the guy that had been playing Phantom, unfortunately, um, became ill and he had to leave the show. Uh, and so they whipped me over there and brought somebody else in to play uh, in Les Miserables. Uh, so we, we went over there and uh, to, play the, to play the Phantom, it's, you have to have a state of mind. You have to be as one with the character because you have no um, physical way, uh, a mental way of portraying him because you've got a mask on and your head is totally covered with makeup and with prosthetics. And so you literally, you rely on your body language to convey part of what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And so they took me into rehearsal rooms uh, and we're rushing. Uh, to learn the, the role. And uh, Jeff Ferris, who was uh, the in-house director, was in charge of that. And you've got a picture that uh, the actual rehearsal room is all mirrors going right the way around. So no matter which way you look, you can see a part of you. 
And uh, I went in there um, with script, uh, trying to learn it at the same time. And I got nowhere. I was absolutely rubbish. It was dreadful. And we're like three, four, five days in, and I'm getting absolutely nowhere with it. And then Jeff came up with a brainwave. He said, let's just put the makeup on him. Put the makeup on me. Put the, the suit on me and everything else. And all of a sudden, as though somebody turned a light on. Uh, and when, when, I'm going to stand up. When, when, I, when I had the, the costume on, all of a sudden, I started using my hands and my fingers. And that became uh, a main part of, of the characterization of the Phantom with me playing it. And the walk, the walk was very, all of a sudden you walked on your toes, you were very balletic, the way you moved around the, the stage. And it, it, it was an automatic thing. It wasn't something I thought about, it just happened. And once that happened, then I could get to grips with the characterization of him, with the pieces, that, uh, with the, the, the words that were written for him and the songs that were written for him. Where did you find that character? Because you've often been referred to as the definitive phantom. Uh, it's, it just came. It, I didn't have to think about it. That's what I'm saying. When that thing was put on me, um, all of a sudden you haven't got a face. Your face is a mask, uh, especially with that underneath it. So you have to rely on your body language to convey certain aspects of his character. And so I was glad I played it when I played it. <laughs> There's a certain line which I'm going to ask you to repeat. Oh, where, when you say this line, the whole audience, you could have heard a pin drop. And it's the famous line when you try my patience. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah. That, that came uh, quite naturally you get great Christines, and I, I, had, I worked with some wonderful Christines that would, would uh, just draw it out of you. And when he sits on the throne, and he knows that he's lost everything, really, and he's got no comeback, and she says the, the words to him, and he comes back with the, you try my patience, you can either shout it like they used to, or you can just take it to something that really was a bit far out. And I just had the ability to take the breath in. You try my patience. It just, it just, and that conveyed to me the actual feeling I wanted the audience to feel. Like it's just a bit out of this world. You were never sure which direction it was going to go. That's right, that's right. And it, when Hal came to see it, Hal Prince, and, and he uh, stood at the back of the hall and he watched, he loved it. He loved that moment. And he came down and he said, please keep the voice going. Uh, right the way through to the next time. You try my patience, make your choice. And uh, I said, no, I can't. I don't want to do that. That's, then you're you're giving it away and, and it is too affected. I said, but just that one moment. And he said, yeah, okay. He said, I'll go with that. You're right. And we did. Fascinating. Most people who go to the theatre arrive at between, sort of say, seven o'clock for a half past seven show. Now, obviously, the role of the Phantom, there is a lot of technical things that you have to get ready for. Obviously, there's the outfit, there's the makeup. What time would you have to get to the theatre for? And how long would it take the prosthetics and the makeup process? Well, when I first took over the role, it was a two and a half hour job to get all that done. Uh, that piece, uh, as you can see, goes on the top. That goes there. Uh, and underneath that is a ball cap, which has to be, excuse me, it has to be put in place. And uh, so it, it, and then they would paint the piece on your head. So they'd stick all that on and then uh, they would uh, take the time then to, to paint the pieces. And, and I say, well, forgive me for saying, but you could stick that to a polystyrene head and paint the pieces at your leisure. You don't need me to be the, underneath them while you do it. 
And so they did, and that, that reduced uh, the time on it hugely for not only for while I was doing it, but for the phantoms that followed. So then, um, like I, before they, we did that, I'd, I'd go in there with a book, a magazine. Um, I'd do writing letters. I'd, Could you be sitting there for two and a half hours? You know, well, that's a, a long time to be sat in a chair. And uh, it ended up, they still would take an hour or more even after they would paint the pieces separately and then stick them on afterwards. It still take an hour to hour and a half to get everything done. Wow. Now, you've performed The Phantom over three and a half thousand times around the world. I know. How did the different audiences around the world react to The Phantom? Well, it was, it was great because I, I, I did it out in Hong Kong, in America. In America, they would just, they'd go wild. They would go wild. They'd scream and shout. It was so vociferous. But then that is very American, isn't it? You know, you, you, you see how American people are. And they're very, uh, where, where all their emotions are on the sleeve, which is great. Uh, in, when I did it in Singapore and Hong Kong, they, they had uh, two big screens either side of the stage. And you'd have, on the one screen, you'd have it done in one of the languages, and in the other side, they'd have it done in another, because there's two different languages in the Far East, as you know. And so you'd be singing it in English on stage, uh, but looking at the audience, as the Phantom spent an awful lot of his time uh, looking at the audience, because he was a solo person, uh, the only other person he had um, relations with was Christine. So when Christine wasn't on, on set, then he'd be dealing with the audience. And it was, when I first went to Hong Kong, which is where I did it first to, to that uh, scenario, it was like looking at a tennis match because the head would go like that and then the head would go like that and then they'd look in the middle and then they, so they'd be continually bouncing back and forth. I found that very disconcerting, but it, you know, it was still the reaction at the end of it. And they, they didn't scream and shout, they just stood up, stood up as one, and it was wonderful. You know, wow, fantastic. I know. I know one great. of the most iconic images of the Phantom is obviously the mask. Oh. We're lucky enough that you've actually brought your original Phantom yeah. mask with you today. How do, you, how do you think that that's progressed over time? Because obviously the mask has had very different designs as well. Has that changed from person to person, or is it, is it an age thing? Or did you have any input in the design of your mask? No input on it whatsoever, but it's because it, uh, the mask is, is often made now by different um, artists. And performing the Phantom with the mask on, how mm. does that feel? You'd forget it was on. That was the, the weirdest thing. As long as the lip... If the lip was too near your mouth, you'd, that would impede you slightly. But generally, it was, um, you got so used to the mask, you, you forget. I remember when I was in Her Majesty's um, and we had riots. Remember we had a lot of poll tax riots. And it was, they'd had a big thing in Trafalgar Square and the crowd was in riotous mood and was roaring up. Uh, past the theater, and I was in between two shows, and obviously I, I'd keep my, my makeup on, so I'd be in there for the, the two hours uh, doing nothing. And all this, I'd watch television, or I'd write notes, letters, and make phone calls. Um, I heard this, this huge riotous crowd, and with, <laughs> without thinking, I went to the window, and I'm looking out, I'm forgetting that I was like that. It was exactly like that. And all of a sudden, the crowd came past, and they looked up, and they saw this, this face looking down at them, and the whole, the whole riotous mob stopped, and they all came and looked at me. And I said, oh, God, <laughs> what can you do? I waved. Hi. <laughs> I went back in. But uh, you do. You forget you got it on, and uh, you can get some funny creations with that. Now, obviously, you've, you've performed The Phantom, as we said, thousands and thousands of times. Mm. Is there any particular standout moment for you? 
I know that must be a very tough <laughs> question to well, answer. Gen generally, it's when something fails. Uh, there are several moments which uh, leap to mind. Uh, the number of times, and this once again, this applied to where you were playing the role. If I was in Toronto, for instance, um, the theater had a, like a street. It's a lane, but it's, it's wide enough to be a street at the back uh, where you entered the building um, and left the building. Uh, and taxis used to go up and down it, cutting through. Well, the frequency for the boat was the same as the taxi. So the number of times that I would pull out, down once more to this dungeon of my black despair, and you'd pull out to turn left. But the bloody taxi kept going straight, and so you'd, suddenly you'd find yourself going straight on one side and off the other. And then you'd have to leap out of the, the, the boat, and I'd grab hold of Christine's hand, and we'd walk on water for a bit while we came back and walked down walk down while, while I'd still be singing. And that happened not only to me, to loads of phantoms. A fascinating insight there, Peter, to your life and role as the Phantom of the Opera. Now, you mentioned that during your downtime, you like to write, write letters, mm. and I believe that you also like to la write music. I do, yeah. Uh, and the next song you're going to sing, you actually co-wrote. I did, yeah. So it... tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I was in a, um, a very good friend of mine, is a guy called... Maldrin Pope, Mal Pope, and he's an artist and a, and a writer, and he's very, very talented, Welsh guy. And uh, he'd written a, a musical called Amazing Grace, and it was being produced by the Welsh uh, Theatre Company. And uh, I, I got the, I was the protagonist in this, the Reverend Peter Price, uh, who is a bit of a fanatical. Uh, preacher from Merthyr Tydfil, which is a, a quite a well-known area of Wales uh, and full of mining people and uh, a bit rough around the edges. And uh, the character which Mal wrote about was a guy called Evan Roberts, who was round, who was from Swansea area, and was a, a, also a preacher, uh, but uh, a self-professed. Pre uh, preacher. He wasn't uh, ordained or anything like that. And that got up the nose of um, the Reverend Peter Price, who became very judgmental on, uh, on Evan Roberts. And so he storms over to, um, to Swansea to confront this upstart who's professing to talk to God, and God is talking to him. And uh, he steams into this chapel full of Evan Roberts supporters. And there's a big argument ensues where, you know, the people suddenly storm out of there, and as does Evan Roberts, and it leaves um, the Reverend Peter Price sitting there all on his own. And he sings, he has to sing a song, and we couldn't find a song for him, so we wrote, Mal and myself got together. Mal had written a, a kind of a, a pop song uh, which we took, and then we altered it uh, and rewrote it. And it became um, where the preacher, Evan Roberts, uh, preacher Peter uh, Price, is uh, praying to God. And when he's doing that, this is the song. It's called, You Never Threw a Party for Me. He complains at God and shouts at God in the chapel and uh, ends up falling on his knees. And it's a very dramatic song. Uh, and I got a great deal of pleasure singing it. Thank you for that introduction, Peter. I'll let you go off now and get ready for that song. OK, good. So Peter next will be singing from the musical Amazing Grace with music and lyrics by Mal Pope and Peter Carey, You Never Threw a Party for Me. Our Father. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. What is it? What is it? What is it about this strange young man? How is he able to get right beneath my skin? Why would all my life? 
It's been my privilege to call you a friend and colleague for the best part of the last 20 years. And hearing the stories from others like Rhea Jones and John Owen Jones has brought back so many memories for me as well. Like that voice. As Rhea said, so often it would be, uh, hello, love, uh, no voice, no voice tonight. And then you'd go, oh, <laughs> no voice. And then you'd go on stage and you'd completely rip it up and be a showstopper. And then there's your timekeeping. As John Owen Jones said, turning up just before going on stage, so many memories for me are of you giving me a call as we're in rehearsal saying, oh, I don't love, uh, stuck on the bridge, be with you as soon as possible. It got to the stage where I used to refer to you as the late Peter Carey, not because you'd passed on to a, a different calling, but because you were late. But once you got onto that stage, you owned it. You would raise your game, and also you would raise the game of those around you who knew that if they had to be on the same stage as Peter Carey, they better be at their very best. And I had the privilege of writing songs especially for you, like You Never Threw a Party for Me in the musical Amazing Grace. And you know, some nights I'd be there with the band playing along and thinking, it's like hearing these words for the very first time. I mean, sometimes that was because you'd forgotten the, the real words and were making them up as you were going along. But they always rhymed, Peter. 
they always rhymed. It's been so much fun working with you and knowing you. You are a legend. That voice is magic. And the way that you use it, you are a master craftsman. I hope you have a great night tonight. Sorry I can't be with you. And I hope it's not too long till we can see each other and work together again. So lots of love from Swansea, from me, Mal Pope. Hi, Peter. John from Witness here. Maybe a difficult question for you to answer, but which role did you prefer to play, the Phantom or Jean Valjean, and why? Th that is such a, a hard question to answer. Um, I love playing them all. Um, I love playing Phantom uh, for what that was. I love playing Jean Valjean. It was a tremendous role. Um, in fact, all the roles I've, I've played, whether it's Judas upwards or whatever, the only one that I would say was uh, not one of my favorites was uh, playing the American in chess. Hi, Peter, Ben here. Out of all the people in musical theater, you have had the opportunity to play some incredible roles from Che in Evita to the Phantom in the Phantom of the Opera. So my question for you is, what advice would you give to someone who's wanting to go into the musical theater industry? Thank you. Um. Hi, Ben. Um, well, I wouldn't say I've, I've got advice. You've got to look to yourself. Um, you have terrific talent. I have seen your work, and I really think that you've, you've got a great future ahead of you. Um, you've got to believe in yourself if you want other people to believe in you. You don't have to show it uh, that you believe in yourself, but just silently, quietly, um, know that you can do it. And if you, if you get to that stage, uh, other people will know you can do it as well. And it's a form of confidence without being overbearing too much. Uh, I wish you well. You're going to do great. Hi, Peter. Who did you enjoy working with the most in your career? And who did you look up to for inspiration? Chris Gronendahl was six foot four. I used to look up to him a lot. Um, Chris, no, I'm joking. Chris Gronendahl was an, another phantom friend of mine uh, from America, great performer. Um, who I looked up to? Um, I looked up, I, I guess, to all the people I've worked with in their own way because each of them uh, have got there because of a reason uh, of talent because of a reason of performance. Um, they all have something which is special. And uh, uh, you, you dine out on that as a person working with somebody who has talent. You can't help but admire it. You can't help but uh, also adopt a little bit of it. And it will benefit your own performance by seeing how other people work. So it's not a question of looking up to uh, great performance is looking up to all performers who are great and uh, and taking what they have to offer and trying to make it work with whatever you've got. Hi Peter. Firstly, I just wanted to say how incredibly talented you are and thank you for the entertainment that you've given us for so many years. My question for you is, of all the productions and the performances that you've done, is there any one performance that is particularly memorable for you? And if so, which one and why? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, this, that's a double-edged sword you just thrown me there, Catherine, because um, there are many performances which, which uh, stand out to me, which were dreadful and uh, that I wish I'd never done. And you have to go through those to get to the good ones, which you hopefully will perform regularly. Um, so, yes, I guess so, but I can't, I can't isolate one and say that performance. I can tell you some horror stories. I, I know I fell out the angel once and uh, seriously damaged my legs. Um, that was a performance I'll never forget. Um, there was a, a, another time uh, when I was playing Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar, and I literally got hung because when he commits suicide uh, or kills himself, uh, it was staged uh, in, the, in the production that I, I worked in, which was uh, in London. You get hung, 
and so somebody would attach, you back yourself up to the, the, the back curtain and somebody would hang, uh, um, hook you up to a, 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 a loop that's on your neck uh, and a brace which is around your chest and then they'd hoist you up. And when they did that, uh, they got me to the top but unfortunately the, it broke and I did actually start to get throttled and they had to, the guys up in the flies had to pull me up pretty quick and save my life. So that one I remember vividly. Um, but other than that, uh, nothing particular, except I enjoyed every one of them. <laughs> Man of La Mancha is a classic musical written by Mitch Lee with lyrics by Joe Darian. It tells the story of the mad knight Don Quixote as a play within a play as he awaits a hearing with the Spanish Inquisition. The next song is sung as Don Quixote stands vigil over his armour in response to Aldonza's question about what he means about following the quest.
Hi Peter, Roy Noble here of BBC Radio Wales. We've had a few interviews, haven't we? It's about time they had a celebration of your life and performances as well. You've been absolutely stupendous. I regard you now as a friend, of course. I've interviewed you many times. But the, the great visits were to London for Elaine and myself to see you in the Phantom, the greatest ever. And also a Jean Valjean in Les Mis carrying Marius around that revolving stage. Stroll on. And also that unforgettable visit we had to Toronto, Elaine and I, when I was speaking to the Welsh Society there on their celebrations of St. David's Day. And you were there uh, performing in The Phantom. And Elaine's claim to fame is that when we went to your apartment to actually visit you, she ironed your shirts. So that's still in her memory too. Hello, lovely Peter. It's Kerry Ellis here. Now, I just want to, um, to send you lots of love and hopefully, you know, I get to see you out and about or you get to see me out and about on a show soon. I, I hope you've been entertaining people through lockdown um, in some way, maybe on your Zoom chats or, or some, uh, you know, over the phone from your doorstep. Um, but I think you've done this industry much a service and we thank you for shining the way and sharing your talents and um, all the best. Hey, Peter. Little did I realise that when I sat in the stalls of Her Majesty's Theatre in June 1990, weeping like a child that I still was, that one day the guy whose performance had just reduced me to tears I'd one day get to sing with. What a privilege that's been. I feel amazingly blessed to have grown up in a generation who witnessed a golden age in musical theatre in London. And there were so many amazing shows and amazing performers like yourself who brought them to life. I just want to thank you for the way that you've encouraged me and many others who don't have your natural gifts, but who share your passion for music. You give so generously of your time and your talents, and I'm just so grateful for that. I'm looking forward to the next time. Take care. I have many fond memories of the times I've spent with Mr. Carey in the late 90s, watching him in Dufferin Gardens and other magnificent venues around the UK. I even got to um, witness him perform Phantom of the Opera, the Millennium Tour all over the UK. I used to pop up in Bradford or in Southampton and say, can I come in? And he'd let me sit in the dressing room or in the wings and then go to the after show meal where all the cast seemed to be captivated. He always held court at the top of the table by him and it was... Uh, yeah, an incredible experience. I was very lucky. And then in my testimonial year in 1999, he so kindly did a performance, Moon Meets the Phantom. And he sang some incredible songs and allowed me on the stage when he sang Bring Him Home. And uh, I cried. Um, I'd like to say it was a duet, but uh, maybe not. I was able to fulfil one of his dreams that he hadn't been able to achieve um, until 2000, the summer of, where I got him on the wing to play against the Scarlet 70s, 80s and 90s in my testimonial year. He was magnificent. He had pace, power, he had dexterity, he had agility, and he took on Yian Evans, Wales and British Lions, legend on the outside, only to be hit by the invisible sniper. He got him in the hamstring, Basically, he pulled his hamstring. <laughs> he was going round him, and it was a definite try. Peter, you are one of my best mates. I um, look forward to catching up with you soon. You're a true legend, a true friend. Love you dearly. Take care. Peter Carey, in my own small way, it's a pleasure to pay tribute to you on this special occasion for your long career and all the passion you put into your performances and, and the passion you have for the industry. You encourage all the youngsters coming up through, which is so important, especially at times like this, because they're our future. And you're never too big for your boots. You're never too posh. You're always a laugh. You always let everyone on stage with you shine in their own way. You give them space, and, and I appreciate that. Just watching you in the wings, I've learned so much over the years that you don't know. First time I saw you was around 1987-88 in the Hippodrome Theatre in Bristol and you were playing Shea in Evita. 
and I was sat in the audience and I was like that. Amazing. Every time you came on stage, fantastic, powerful, magnetic performance. And I was sat there going, oh, I'd love to get up there and sing with him. He's cracking. He's an amazing singer. What I would, oh, I'd love, I hope one day I can get up there and sing with somebody like that. Get her off and get me up. Little did I know further down the line that I'd have that opportunity many times and you're always, you're always a privilege to work with. You know, there's, there's never any fuss and bother, we just get on with it. You put 100% into every performance that you do and I appreciate that and I, and I respect that a lot. Hi, I'm Travis George, I'm a professional actor and singer and I wouldn't be able to say that if it wasn't for Peter Carey. Hi Peter, I have lots of lovely memories of us performing together, especially when we sang The Phantom and messed up all the verses. Um, I can remember when I was in Eurovision and you travelled all the way to North Wales to support me and drove all the way back in one night. You also helped me with the songs for The Voice and your support is endless and I know that you'll continue to support me in whatever I do. I'd like to sing a song for you now, which, which I wrote uh, quite a while ago. Uh, I did a, a bit of research on this. Tommy Atkins is the name of the song, and Tommy Atkins was the first person ever to win a Victoria Cross. And uh, he was a soldier of uh, immense proportions and talent and uh, courage and what have you. And so I wrote this song, and I hope you're going to like it. I enjoy singing it.
Pete, we've heard some amazing songs tonight and some of your incredible stories. In your spare time throughout your career, you've always been working on your own music, and I believe you've also written your own musical. Could you tell us a little bit more about the future now and what it holds for you and your own original material? Well, uh, you're quite right. I, I have spent a lot of time kind of writing stuff and, and so forth. I, I think when you work in an atmosphere where everybody's so creative, it, it kind of infects you and you end up doing it as well. And uh, I've written a couple of books, uh, which hopefully are going to be published shortly. And uh, I've written a couple of musicals. Uh, one of them is Rasputin, all about Rasputin, which um, I love the subject matter. And it inv but it's a massive, it's taken a long, long time to, to write this musical because of course it includes a, a revolution, it includes the demise of a royal family and uh, besides Rasputin himself. So it, it really is an interesting uh, kind of subject matter. Uh, so that's what I'm concentrating on and uh, promoting the two books uh, with a pile of songs attached as well. Peter, I've enjoyed immensely tonight looking back at your amazing career and hearing your fantastic story. So thank you for joining us here at the Bowden Rooms. Thank you very much for having me. It was a uh, pleasure. It was all mine. I, it's funny, you know, uh, you, you, you live a life and you work and you kind of perform and then all of a sudden somebody makes you look back on it and you don't realise you did as much as you did. Uh, I want to thank you for that. It's been a great pleasure. I want to thank you for for listening and hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have a kind of singing for you and talking to you. And I hope I meet you all individually or collectively sometime in the future. Take care. Singing his final song of the night from the 1997 Broadway musical, Jekyll and Hyde. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed this evening as much as I have, presenting Peter Carey live from the Bowdoin Rooms in Cheshire. And now for the final time this evening, singing This Is The Moment, often imitated, but rarely matched. Please welcome back to the stage for his final song, Mr. Peter Carey. Is the moment This is the day This is the moment When I know I'm on my way Every endeavor I have made ever Is coming into play Is here now and today This is the moment This is the time When the momentum And the moment Are in rhyme Give me this moment This moment This moment I'll gather up Make some sense of last. This is the moment when all I've done, all of the screaming, scheming, and dreaming becomes one. Give us this day, make it sparkle and shine. When all I've lived for. Now 
the time has come to prove that I cannot make it on my own. Sweetest moment.